are necessary. Factions are necessary. Now that title may seem strange to some. And of course that means I have to ask the question, well how, how is it that factions in the church, the church Jesus built, the church he purchased with his own blood, how is it that they are necessary? I know that Jesus prayed that his disciples might all be one, even as he and his heavenly Father are one, John 17, 21. I know that the Holy Spirit had Paul in writing part of the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ address and even admonish the church in Ephesus saying to them endeavoring to keep the unity which means the oneness of the Spirit that which the Spirit reveals seeing that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit Ephesians 6.17 in the bond of peace Ephesians 4 and verse 3 endeavoring that's putting all you got into it you know to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We would say that unity that the Lord paid for is extremely desirable. That harmony that He wants all to enjoy is ideal. Back in the Old Testament in Psalm 133 in verse 1, the psalmist exclaimed, Behold! How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There are many scriptures like this, both Old and New Testament. So from the foregoing scriptures and others like them, we know that there will not be a need for factions. Wait a minute. Are you going goofy more than usual? <laughs> you just said factions are necessary. Well, Titus was told by Paul to reject a factious man after the first and second warning or admonition, Titus 3 and verse 10. How is it factious and necessary? Seeing what the Bible says about unity, peace, and harmony, oneness. One of the things, according to Proverbs 6, verses 16 and 19, is that which the Lord hates, that is, among the things He hates, is one who spreads strife among brothers, among the brethren. We're taught by Paul as he writes to the church in Rome, in Romans 14, 19. And we're to pursue those things that make for peace. Of course, we have to find peace the way the Bible defines peace. The gospel's pictured as the gospel of peace. Jesus is rightly called the Prince of Peace. Of course, the point being, and catch it right here, we pursue that peace on the terms that the Lord sets out in His Word. That's important. Therefore, biblical definitions are important. And understanding how we find that peace with God and with ourselves and those of like-minded belief and faith. Although there are times when division is needless and wrong, sinful, and those who do it will lose their soul. I'm back now to the original title about factions are necessary. There are other times when division is necessary. I remember reading about situation. By the way, this is the school from whence came uh, Texas Christian University called Adran College. It was started, whether you know it or not, by members of the church. Of course, it was taken over by those of the apostasy of the 19th century, turning into Fort Worth, or not Fort Worth, but uh, what did I say, Texas Christian. And of course, it's controlled today by even the liberal side of that bunch. That's the Disciples of Christ Christian Church. Well, the brother there had sons. Adran College was going the urge and the push to get the instrument into the worship was there. So they had a meeting started in the college auditorium at what was called, as I said, Adoran College. And the old brother, the father, said, we're not going to use a mechanical instrument. Well, the sons had an integral part in the school, the running of it, and they said they were going to use it. 
So when there was the assembly that day, the majority were there. And they had the piano, organ, I forget which now, up in a prominent position. And the son, again I forgot his name, as he announced things, getting all the preliminaries out of the way, said to the lady who was playing it, whose name was Bertha, play on, Miss Bertha. At which time, his father rose up, and with several others, walked out of the assembly. Now they desired, as much as any godly person would desire, to have peace, harmony, and unity. But you see, when people inject, either by their lives and or their teaching, that which is contrary to the doctrine of Christ, if we try to stay together on that basis, then we're just crying out, peace, peace, when there is no peace. We need to understand that. So we pursue the things which make for peace, but we pursue them on the Lord's terms. Thus we have the statement serving as the text for our sermon. King James reads, For there must be also heresies among you. But then he tells us why. That they which are approved may be made manifest or revealed among you. Well, I begin to learn something there if I didn't know it already from other passages of Scripture. There are trying times for everybody. Now, the quicker I learn that to obey the gospel and live the Christian life, adhering steadfastly to that which is approved of God, that which is authorized by God, is going to cause problems with those who don't love the Lord and don't want to keep His commandments, and the better off I'll be. Because then I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen, and I can prepare for it. A heresy is a faction. So there must also be factions among you. So that they who are approved may be approved, or one version says, evident, made known, 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. So we're not saying we shouldn't desire and pursue peace, harmony, and unity. Oh, no. When we preach Christ and Him crucified, that's what we desire. When we preach Christ and Him crucified, and all that that implies, then that's what we're doing. When Philip went down to Samaria, he preached Christ and things concerning the kingdom of God. When Stephen preached the gospel, when Paul preached, Peter preached, John preached, whoever it was, then they were preaching that which if men from the heart would believe it with all their heart and act upon it, they would be reconciled to God, justifying His sight, and the same will be true with everybody else who believe and love the truth. It's the only way biblical unity, peace, and harmony is going to exist. So Paul is telling the brethren at Corinth that there were times when peace, harmony, and unity are wrong. There are times when factions must exist. And I gave you an example of an actual historical happening. When men want to inject that which is not authorized into Christianity, those who love the truth. Well, there's a reason Stephen was stoned. He wouldn't compromise. He told it like it was. He said to those people out of love for their soul exactly what they needed to hear. They didn't believe it. it didn't suit them. They were so angry with him, they would have killed him. And they did. You know, the only thing that keeps a lot of people from putting us in jail and killing us today? The laws of the land. Because they would if they could. But they can't. How do we determine then when such division is necessary? Notice I said necessary. The topic is factions are necessary. I hope the groundwork has been laid well enough for everybody to follow me and understand what I'm talking about. Well, Paul helped answer this question. In the second Corinthian epistle, when he wrote, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Might as well say the devil. 
Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Again, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 15. Now the point is, he did not say, be ye not yoked. That would be leaving out a word, wouldn't it? He said, be ye not unequally yoked. With who? Those not Christians. Unbelievers. Those who don't believe in Christ. Well, I want you to think about this for a minute. Does anybody even know, in view of how far we've removed ourselves from the agricultural background, what a yoke is when I speak of a yoke of oxen? Well, many years ago, there were oxen, cattle, that were used for pulling things. So they're exceedingly strong, slow, but very strong. And in order to get the most out of both, then they had a yoke that held them together, a wooden yoke. You still see some in some places. Now, the funny thing about it is, Daddy told me about a situation in North Africa among the Arabs. And he said, you've never seen such a sight until you see a camel and a donkey yoked together trying to pull a cart. <laughs> that is unequally yoked. And Paul is saying here, if you love the Lord, you're seeking first the kingdom of God, you've been baptized into Christ, you're a new creature in Christ, you're doing only what's authorized by the Lord, that's all that interests you, you're seeking to preach the gospel and defend the faith, to be a godly man or husband or father or woman, wife, mother, whatever, if you're serving Christ faithfully, you cannot build up a relationship with those outside of Christ or those that are apostate that makes you a donkey yoked up with a camel. That's unequally yoked. So nothing wrong with being yoked to a point, but when evil, you're so close to evil people, people don't love the Lord, don't care about obeying Him, that it begins to rub off on you, you've got a problem with understanding that evil companionship corrupts good morals. Let's use for an example... Someone may go into business with a childhood friend, not a Christian. One is a Christian. And the Christian may go into business in a partnership. They both know the business. They've known one another since childhood. But one's not a Christian. They go into business, let's say, more in the grocery business. All's going well. Until the non-Christian, who's still interested in money about as much as anybody would be, especially since he's got a business for that purpose, to make money. He wants to put in beer and wine to sell it, as is common in most of the big supermarkets. Now, what's the Christian going to do who's equal partner to business? Well, he cannot compromise at all. It may mean to where he just simply has to leave the business. Leave the livelihood, the investment. May very well mean that. Because he would be unequally yoked to that which is contrary to the doctrine of Jesus Christ, which he purports to advocate, defend, and live. That's bringing it down to very practical levels. I, I fear greatly sometimes all people see in this is that uh, as it relates to marriage when marriage is not even mentioned now the principle certainly is here but it applies in ways I just described because it's not even applied to marriage here so if you zero just in on that and who wouldn't say who would dare say knowing the scriptures that it's a wise thing for a faithful Christian to marry an un, uh, a non-Christian for that matter an unfaithful Christian but that's not the point here's a principle that applies to a whole host of things not just a marriage. It applies to being close to anybody in the world to the point that you would compromise to stay in that group or with that person or persons. And that's the point. You cannot be yoked so much with somebody that it becomes unequal. You're staying with them when they're sinning and drawing you into sin. Now, a point. If that is not what Paul meant to get over to those brethren and to us, what would he have to write to get it over? When others continue in unbelief, lawlessness, and darkness of every description, 
2 Corinthians 6, 17 says this. Come ye out from among them. Sounds like a division to me. And be ye separate. Sounds like a division to me. And who said it? Saith the Lord. And what? Touch not the unclean thing. Then I'll do something. I will receive you. What does that imply about if you stay with that which is sinful? Supporting it. Involving yourself in it. I'm not going to receive you. You've cut yourself off from me. You've engaged in sin. The transgression of my law. So unity cannot continue. Not scriptural unity. Factions then you see are necessary at times. There must be division between the faithful in Christ. And those believing and practicing error. Clearly, we must exercise time for erring brethren to repent. Revelation 2.21 Time must be allotted on a case-by-case -case basis. I can't emphasize that enough. Case-by-case -case basis. There may be much more need to study with one person than it would be another. People can get themselves in a mess. They don't even know they're in a mess. But God thought that if you learned the truth, you could figure out you are in a mess. And if you're what you ought to be, you'll come out of the mess. It's called repentance and embracing the truth. Accepting it. Abiding by it. But now watch out. How long, in any case, is it? Long-suffering cannot be allowed to evolve into tolerating sin. How do I know that? Well, a number of ways. But the last book of the Bible, the letters addressed to the seven churches of Asia, that's exactly what the Lord addresses. What was going on in 1 Corinthians? Had a man had his father's wife. Paul says, well, even the Corinthians who are noted for their ungodliness and immorality, you've done something here even the Corinthians don't do. And what was the situation with the brethren? They were puffed up about it. Seemed not bother them at all. And the Lord tells them exactly through Paul by the Holy Spirit what to do with that person. None of that was to be done to despise the person, hate the person, and put the person down. It was designed to get the person to repent so he could go to heaven. That's the love of God. That's God's love for us. And the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular exhibit that same kind of love to people in sin. That's why Stephen died, folks. The long suffering of the Lord can run out. If you read Revelation chapter 2, verse 21, there was somebody there by the name of Jezebel that was teaching brethren to sin. Teaching the BM oral, in fact. It makes it clear she didn't want to repent, but she wanted to be a remain part of the church. <coughs> and John makes it clear as he writes that letter, as Jesus speaks through him by the Spirit. You got to do something about that. And what was it? Separate yourself from her. When brethren become unwilling to study, when they want to continue in their sin or sins, whatever they may be then the time of long-suffering has ceased. Division is a very, very distasteful idea. Especially when we make sacrifices in opposing our family and our friends. I don't know where we ever got the idea that everything we do in the Lord makes us just feel so good. Have you forgotten Gethsemane? And have you forgotten the cross? Have you forgotten all the perils that Paul lists that he suffered for the cause of Christ? Have you forgotten his statement to Timothy that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution? No faithful child of God desires division. But there are times when division is necessary. Now, these situations are always difficult. I don't know how anybody can say there ever would be anything else. Well, we can say difficult to one extent or the other. But we must. It's imperative 
It's obligatory on us if we'll be faithful to God and go to heaven. Remember that ultimately and finally we are striving to reign loyal to Christ. That's the whole point. Nothing else matters but to remain loyal to Christ. To be faithful to Him. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. That means to do what God said. Now that's what you've got in the Bible. I know that verse 19 is going to read on the Day of Judgment just what it reads now and mean then what it means now. There are a host of churches throughout the land, churches of Christ, that are paying no attention to this. In fact, what they're trying to determine, trying to figure out, is how to stay with people who will not repent of their sins. Whatever the sin is, that doesn't make any difference. But we must stand for Christ regardless of the consequences. Even if it means losing friends and family. Matthew 10, 34 and 37. And Jesus vaccinated us against that. By pointing out such is going to happen. It's a reality. It's part of walking the straight and narrow way. Expect it. Expect it. Can you imagine, and I always fall back on this, any soldier being trained to go into battle, and yet the drill sergeants and the officers are, are all saying, I don't worry, nothing happened to you. It's a piece of cake. Have you ever watched any of those, what few there are, films of those men hitting the beaches on Normandy? Trained, brand new clothes, brand new gun, probably never been fired. Been trained for months and months and months. They hit the water and you can see some of them go, right down they go. That's the end of it. Thousands gave their lives like that for the freedom of this country. How much more so for the freedom of the kingdom of God as God defines freedom? What good can come from division? Well, Paul, inspired of the Spirit, writing part again of the New Testament, said the factions were necessary. Do you understand why now? Better at least. He says, so that those who are approved may become evident or known among you. As long as we're in this world, the devil is going to try us. That's how God uses the devil. He's going to try us. He's going to test our faith. He's going to see how much you love the Lord, how much you love the Word, how much you love the church. And when we compromise, we show God we don't really care that much for Christ or His church or His authority. The Lord demands there be a clear distinction between His people and those of the world. Christians are a purchased people which makes them different because they're new creatures in Christ and they live as the New Testament guides them, 1 Peter 2.9. We're plainly told that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed, Romans 12.2. How, how is a person transformed? How is he changed from a person who lives according to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life? Well, now he listens to the Lord. He does what the Bible says. He cuts himself loose from anything that hinders him from doing that. We are taught that we are to appear as lights in the world. Philippians 2 and verse 15. That means we must live the truth. Stand for the truth. We must keep the ranks of Christ's army pure. Do we stand out as God's special people? By our actions? By our associations? Or do we blend in with the world around us? You can't tell the difference in a member of the church and a member of the Hudal Lodge or something. We must be distinct in life and doctrine. So it's clear to all that we're standing with and that we are for Christ, the Word of God, and living like it directs. And we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that is planted by the water, the old song says, we shall not be moved. And that means there are going to be people who, who really don't like us sometimes. Have you ever noticed kids playing together? Have you ever noticed how they can call one another names? Man, they can call one another some of the... Well, they'll call one another the ugliest names they can think of. That may not be that bad at a certain stage, but they sure don't mind doing it. Well, that happens also when it comes to living righteous lives in the church 
and standing for the truth and living the truth. The Lord tried to tell us, you follow me, there's a cross that you daily must bear. Yes, there must be factions among us. Always will be the case. If the church is to remain the church that is of, by, and for Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father so that heaven will be our home. Are you a child of God this afternoon? Are you a Christian? Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the Lord's church. If you are, be as faithful as you know how to be. Teach the truth. Use every opportunity to teach the truth. Try to reach people with the truth. Do all you can to study the Bible and enlighten yourself and teach others. If you're not living on the way you know you ought to live, then you know that you're not what you ought to be. We're not talking about growing and developing. We're talking about engaging in things not authorized by the Bible. That which is a transgression of God's law. If you know that, as surely as you knew what to do to become a Christian, you know what to do to cease from those activities. Repent. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Whatever your status is before God, you and God know exactly what it is. And if you need to change, if you need to repent, now's the time to do it while we stand and while we sing.